Okay, so welcome everybody to the talk of Elliot Hunt today. I would like to also introduce him with saying some sentences about him. So he comes from London and he could already gather a lot of international experience of uh, and companies such as Thomson Reuters, UBS, uh, the GFI Group and BGZ Partners. And he is working for his current company, Phoenix Market Data, since December 2021. And now. Uh, Thank I give you up for to the you. reminder. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as the platinum sponsor uh, today at Phoenix Market Data. Um, I've got the, uh, the somewhat scary title of Disrupting the Incumbents, uh, Unique Data and Solutions Arising from Recent Developments in the OTC Markets. So I'm looking to talk through that today. Um, I've broken down that down into a few different topics. So I'm sort of looking at the today. First of all, who we are. People, lots of people asking us who are Phoenix, where we come from, so we can talk about that. Um, and then really looking at the macro environment today and some of the solutions that we have right now. And then moving forward, um, looking at the regulatory impact on the industry, how that's helped in, da in gathering data. I see it as, as a positive. I might be booed because nobody else likes regulation, but data people do generally. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, disruption, so some of the new, new entries, entrants into the market. I'll talk about our current, my current experience, but also that of building a data business in a bank, which is what I was doing at UBS prior. Um, and then talking about uh, yeah, acquisitions and new initiatives, and then I'll make some conclusions you can agree or disagree with um, and shout over me, and then we can have a bit of a Q&A as well. Um, or we can go for lunch, so, uh, so we'll see. Um, we're also sponsoring the coffee here, so I hope you've all had one so you can stay awake uh, in my graveyard shift before lunch. So we'll see how we go. So in one slide, I think this is a good way to explain Phoenix Market Data. So Phoenix Market Data is, is one name and one brand, but we represent uh, more than 30 different brands of the BGC Partners group of companies. So BGC Partners is a global interdealer broker uh, listed on the NASDAQ, uh, US headquartered. Um, our sister business, Cantor Fitzgerald, probably has a more famous name than BGC, uh, but BGC actually stands for Bernard Gerald Cantor. So that's where the, where the name comes from. And our role at Phoenix Data is, to, is to essentially to gather um, and exclusively distribute um, the, the combined data and assets of all of these different firms. So whether it's coming from BGC, from GFI, from Sunrise, um, fr from all of these different brands, we're the umbrella business that delivers all of that data. So it gives us a wealth of different um, data sets that we can, we can look at and we can play with and we can use. Um, and what's been going on with us recently, so um, this is a slide that I cribbed from our Q1 uh, results, uh, which I thought was quite good. So it talks a bit about our, our growth drivers um, and also sort of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the growth areas that we're seeing really are, are, are rates data, uh, risk-free rates and alternative reference rates. Um, regulation, definitely working in there. So our regulatory solutions business um, is growing, certainly. Um, we're seeing people more inclined to take data directly. Um, so we're able to service that. Um, and also we're, we're sort of staffing up. So we're increasing our sales team, our product and our, our tech teams. Um, and also within the Fenix business, we have some, uh, a Fenix branded platform called Fenix US Treasuries, I'll talk about later. Um, and also a business called Fenix Labs. So it's applying um, AI and machine learning techniques um, and other modeling to content we already have uh, in-house in the shop. OK, so let's talk a bit about macro. So the, the two areas that I thought I'd focus on with, with macro is that you know, interest rates are back, right? Interest rates are rising. Inflation is definitely back. So everybody missed inflation, certainly the inflation brokers and traders. Um, but it's come back with a vengeance now. So those are the two areas we're seeing a, a big change sort of in the macro environment and therefore the, the, the data and the content that we provide um, uh, on that basis. Um, particularly with, with rates data as well, we've seen that taking a, a consultative approach with our clients has been very profitable. So I have some of my team in here, so I'm looking at Steve and, and others, um, you know, working on helping people to switch to those alternative rates, uh, and going through that process, and also for us being able to co-mingle and package content from a number of different brokers means that we can serve both the, the, the legacy reference rates we have and also the rates of tomorrow. Um, so just to give an example, and I realize this is a very small text, <laughs> now I see it in big screen, but really you can see across the top we have a number of different brands. So Phoenix Market Data is us, but we're gathering content from, from BGC partners, from GFI Group, from Freedom Brokers in Canada, and Martin Brokers. So they all have their individual strengths um, and, and, and different products. So you can see across the top, um, yeah, in, in certain markets, so for currency basis swaps, Martin Brokers are very strong in this area. 
freedom will be stronger, obviously, in, uh, in, in Canadian because they're from Canada. So individually, these, these, these don't really cover everything, but by us being able to bring everything together, we can then deliver that all in, in one package. So we're seeing the benefits of that. Um, this is from a, a while ago. We've, we've recently also launched uh, Sing Dollar, Thai Bar, uh, Kiwi, and Honki as well. Um, we announced that a couple of days ago. So that's a continual process, and we're seeing that being a, a key driver of growth. And also that consultative approach really working well, uh, working with our customers to help manage them through that transition. Uh, so next on to interest rate, uh, sorry, on to inflation. So it's a really interesting market that we've got. So um, you know, we're seeing here highs of inflation. So I've quoted a few statistics there, but these are numbers that a year ago we probably would have laughed about. People were talking about inflation maybe coming back, the world opening up. Um, there are a number of factors. There's been, a, there's been a bit of a perfect storm, if you like, in terms of those market concerns. Um, and that's led to clients either wanting to manage inflation and manage that risk, or increasingly take a view on it, right? So if we're talking to some of our buy side clients, they want to they put trades on and take a view. We have other clients, more of the, the traditional asset managers and pension funds who are, um, yeah, are looking to mitigate risk. Um, now that, that brings more volume in the market. So uh, you, know, you can see we have some market share stats here. So we're super strong in, in some particular markets. So dollars, for example, um, uh, sterling and eurozone. Um, but we're also seeing bigger volumes. So you know, volumes are up 40%. Uh, 2020, 2021 to 20, we're seeing uh, inflation options coming back in the market as well, um, having had a hiatus when inflation was really not a front of book story uh, and, a, and a sort of front page story. Um, how do we manifest inflation data sort of in, in our world as interdealer brokers? So, yeah, so we have leading desks and businesses um, along with, with, with other brokers in the market. Um, we then provide uh, fixings, swaps, um, uh, either the zero curves or the, the zero swaps or the year on year swaps and also then the cash instruments so that the tips and the gilt linkers and, and other services there um, in those different markets and we do that across the eurozone um, and the US and we also do some Aussie inflation out of GFI um, in Sydney as well um, so we're seeing that being a, a certainly a, a, a key market for us so moving on to regulation so I think, I think we see this as a positive thing. We probably didn't leading up to MIFID in 2018, or those of us that were involved in it. There's a lot of cost and money and time reading huge documents. Um, but what it's meant is that we, we're better as an industry at capturing and understanding our data. Um, so if we're looking at sort of evolution over time, sadly, I've been in data way too long probably already. But yeah, back in the days when we started looking at data from brokers, it would be uh, a curve or a surface you know, or a mid price. Um, really giving people an indication. It might be a broker screen on, on, on Reuters or on Bloomberg that people can look at. We weren't really capturing all of that trade data. Um, it was written down on blotters. Um, it was maybe done end of day. It was put through for a settlement. Somebody would, a clerk would go and do that. What we're seeing now is that because we need to have the tools to be able to report, we're now capturing a lot more of that content in real time, um, both orders um, and trades, and much more of those uh, sort of executable prices. Now, that was a big project and cost lots of money for a lot of firms, but for us, it's created a treasure trove of data uh, that we can delve into. Um, so now we can, yeah, we're getting that transparency from, from venues, um, and we can apply that to a number of different use cases. So now, now we see quotes and orders. We're actually in the business. You know, we can help people um, uh, for, you know, for in, the, in the IPV space. Um, we can help with TCA. Um, we can help hedge funds look at flow data. Um, so before it was just prices, they're not interested in that. They, look, they want to look at the direction and magnitude of flows. You can do that because we own the venues. Um, you know, we have 3,000 brokers out there. We have um, 30 plus venues that, that are out there where we're collecting this data. We can then build that into a product. Um, and here's a slide that I stole from a colleague who's in row two, uh, talking a little bit about that. So here we're, we're, we're talking about sort of the evolution. So this is driven both by technology um, and by regulation, and they really sort of hand in hand help us to, uh, to, to collect a lot more of this content. So sort of going from left to right across the screen, starting with sort of pricing, indicative pricing and curves, we're then able to take orders. So whether that's from central limit order books, um, from matching sessions, from requests for quotes, we're able to gather all of that content. And then further down the spectrum, you know, we're also able to capture those trades. Now, this is the interesting thing is that you know, we're, not all trades have to be reported. 
So some of them, yes, they're mandatory. You could go to a MIFID website after a certain embargo time and get it. But there's a lot of trade data that is not reported right now. So we're also providing that data. So this isn't just a regulatory play. It's a value-added content play as well. Um, so here are some use cases of this, this order and trade data that we've been able to capture. And these have really been driven by, um, by clients, inbound uh, requests from clients. So clients coming in and saying, can you help me manage my risk? Um, you know, I have this requirement. I have to find an independent source of content or of data. Um, so how can I do that? Now, this is a very wordy slide, and I'm not going to go through it. Don't worry. But really, you know, we have these use cases. So, you know, so the independent price verification. Um, the risk case as well, where they're looking for real price obs observations, um, and also trade surveillance as well. So um, am I trading at the right level? Why am I trading with this counterparty? What other prices are out there in the market? So this is a new thing for us. You know, we, we've always been in the center of the market as an interdealer broker, um, but, but it's, it's never really been clear as to the, you know, how those orders and trades go, and we haven't ever been able to productize that before. So this for us is a relatively new world. So I'm talking, this is sort of the now and the future. So this is a service that we've had available uh, for around a year now and something that we're continuing to, um, to work on. So there's some examples here. Um, it shows relatively well on the slide. Um, so this is a, the, fir the first of our services. So this is level two. So this is a full-time series of order and trade data. Um, I have an example here with FX options. Um, so you can see along here, we can actually see uh, those orders and trades, so the data gathered from those, um, and also some metadata around that. So moving away from uh, pricing or a vol surface that we used to sell um, many years ago, that I used to sell many years ago, sadly, um, we're now able to, to move into this market and to be able to provide this kind of order data and a lot more fields of content. So it's not just a bid and offer volatility um, in a, with a vol surface. This is actually showing what's going on in the market itself. And then we overlay that with something that we call insights. So with insights, we can, we can provide uh, instrument level intelligence on this. So again, without going into the details of all the fields here, I've stuck with FX options as an example. We can actually see things like how many active counterparties, how many trades today, um, how many orders have we had? The at the money is obviously more liquid than the risky here. Um, what's the average order size? So all of this content and information is stuff that you know, we may have known or we may have been able to go and speak to the desk about or get a general feel. Now we can back that up with data because we're capturing it all. So for us, this is, you know, for, I get excited about this. Not everyone might before lunch. But for me, this is a really cool data set. Um, so this is an example with liquidity. And then a further example with pricing. OK, so taking that same idea, we've got this, this instrument level intelligence that, that we can deploy. But now we're talking a little bit about, OK, so what was the last bid? What was the last offer? What was going on in the market? Um, what's our own pricing that we're getting from Phoenix Market Data from those combined 30 plus brokers that we have out there in the market? And then what's the difference? So on the right hand side, you've got the corroboration of, um, of our closing price um, you know, versus the last trade. So where is that trade and, and how's that working? So um, yeah, we're super excited about this as, a, as our sort of, like I say, our today and tomorrow in terms of what we're doing into, uh, with our content. And it shows that evolution from being a pricing data provider, curves and vol surfaces, to these are orders and these are trades. And by the way, here's some intelligence on that, that trade. We can do that for you. Yeah, if you go and talk to a quant hedge fund, for example, I'm sure they have way more quant intelligence. They want to apply on their own from their own business. Um, but we provide this. And like I said, this ranges from everything from IPV and trade surveillance all the way through to being able to look at this as a flow data set to try and understand uh, the, the flows on those venues and the liquidity available. OK, so just talking here about the, sort of the disruption elements. So, so what's changed since we probably all last met here um, yeah, over the last couple of years? Um, there's a few things. So f I have first-hand experience of the sell-side banks getting involved in data. So we always thought of banks as, as consumers of data and people that buy, buy data. Um, and deal, dealing with that business, this is really banks turning that around and saying, actually, data has a lot of value. Um, I can take certain data sets and apply certain techniques and governance on that data and make that available to my clients. Um, so for my, 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 if you like, my hiatus from being at Phoenix, I spent three or four years at UBS. And that's what we were doing at UBS through a business called Data Solutions, which was you know, taking content internally um, and being able to deliver that to clients. Um, and it's, it's a different type of data. So that's single bank data. So it might include axes, it might include other information. 
Um, but banks have access to a lot of different type of content. So they have, you know, for example, prime brokerage businesses. So you can look at, uh, at, at that, that type of content that is quite different to somebody like a, an interdealer broker. We see the whole market. We see the prices from all the banks as a venue. Um, but we might not see some of those other things. So that, that's quite interesting. And we see if not just UBS, a number of banks doing that. Some of the big US guys are in this space. Um, either through their single bank platforms or through APIs. Um, we did everything through Azure, so it was all through REST API delivery. Um, talking of REST APIs and Azure, the, the, cloud bar the cloud providers are out there, so we're all talking to them. We're all trying to work out who we work with, which ones we work with, what's the difference, why is Snowflake different to AWS, different to GCP, you know, so all of those different conversations we had. So, so we're moving towards that. We're going cloudy. Uh, again, we're being client-driven. Uh, towards that rather than sort of if we build it, they will come approach. Um, and I think a number of people are doing that, but that's, that's bringing down the barrier to entry um, on both sides of the market. Um, Interdealer brokers you know, are, are changing models as well and different offerings. Um, so that's another thing that we're seeing changing as well. So that the, the old models that we see are, are changing a bit, as well as the content. So for example, those orders and trades that we were talking about. So yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Um, and also, we see a lot more specialist firms um, and consultants. So talking about people from, from Quandle to, to, to EOS, uh, some of these providers coming in and actually helping people to, to expose data. Um, so you have really, you know, small independent brokers or corporates that have a lot of good data. They won't have a data business. They can essentially go and franchise that um, and, get, and outsource that to somebody else. Um, so that's, that's certainly looking interesting. And then. Yeah, alternative data, a big argument over what's really alternative, what is, what isn't. But there's a huge plethora of different data out there. Um, and with my experience, again, at UBS, they had an alt data business called Evidence Lab, thousands of data sets, you know, footfall data, satellite imagery data, survey data. There's a huge amount out there. It's got more complicated for us to understand all of those different data sets. But you know, it really is, it is the time of data. There's a huge amount out there uh, available. So what are the benefits of that? Well, so there's new, you know, new competition. So there are more players. There are more providers. It's not just about um, you know, going to one or two people. Um, in some cases, it might be. Um, we do see some consolidation. But I'm, I'm quite excited by the fact that we're seeing additional sources coming in. We're seeing other people being able to enter the market. And we're seeing cloud providers able to empower and enable them. So you're not, you're not bound by having to deliver a certain way through a certain channel, um, as you have been in the past. Um, you know, and, and I think that competition is, you know, leads to a number of things. So it's the, it lowers data fees, um, hopefully, um, but also execution fees. And I've got a couple of examples that, that we have within, within our industry that, that, that sort of resonate to me, uh, and I think are good examples of that. So the first one is, uh, is, is Fenix US Treasuries. So, um, so we entered the, the US Treasury market a number of years ago through a platform called FUST, or Fenix US Treasuries. Uh, we started with 0% market share, as you do when you're brand new. Um, and we've slowly been building that. So we're up to now around a 20% share of the market. Um, and that's very interesting for us because we, we, we've, we are now have a data set. Um, and we think about, we thought about the data at the beginning. So when you build a brand new platform these days, you think about how you capture the data, the full order book data, and you make that available. When you've got 0% share of the market or 1% of the share of the market, nobody wants your data. But we're now significant. We're now at over 20%. So that's a big push for us. Um, why should you care? Because it's driven, you know, the bid offer spreads are tighter. The fee structure to trade on, on FUST is lower. So from an execution point of view for our clients, they're getting a better deal. They're trading more cheaply. And then also for us, we're, we're another player in the market. So you know, if, you, if you're looking at dealer web or broker tech pricing, for example, we're another player in the market. Right? We might not win every deal. We'll certainly try our best to do that. But we're, we're able to offer another source of, of data. And because of our tighter pricing, you'd hope that the data, therefore, would also be of high quality. Um, and because it's directly from a venue, again, it's, it's the real deal. You're getting the actual, the actual content itself. Um, and then moving slightly on forward, so this is now looking at interest rate uh, or futures. Um, so this is looking at uh, dollars, euro dollars, for example, with our FMX business. So this is a, a very much a future strategy. So this is for later this year. Um, but if we do the same thing with, um, with rates futures as we've done with, with, uh, with cash treasuries, that will also create um, another very interesting data set. And we're, again, we're going after a particular incumbent in that market. 
um, which the market likes to see. They like choice. Um, hopefully, that will lower execution and clearing fees. Um, but it will, also, um, it will also create some great data that we can provide to the market and, and compete on price um, with those incumbents. Um, so those are two, I think, quite good examples of where we're going in the future with, with, with our business, but also how data is working hand in hand with the execution businesses, um, which again, I think is quite different to many years ago when they were much more siloed. Um, so summary and conclusions, I'm just checking my timing, it's not too bad, I know it's nearly lunchtime. Um, so we're seeing that continued evolution um, you know, from pricing data and curves and surfaces to orders and trades. So that level two and insights data that the, were the examples we had before. And that's driven by technology and regulation, and that's a good thing. Um, also, you know, being able to apply machine learning and AI techniques to content for everything from, from data quality to expanding coverage you know, is very exciting for us. So we have a, a product in FX Options, for example, where you, know, you probably see activity in maybe 80 to 90 currency pairs every day in reality in, in the market in terms of orders and trades. But if you can apply modeling and techniques to that, you can expand that coverage to 300, 400 currency pairs. Um, so we're, we're looking at sort of moving into that space and using, uh, using Phoenix Labs uh, to be able to, 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 grow that, to grow that business. And that's just one example in FX options, but we're seeing that um, across the board. Um, we're seeing new data providers coming in so that you know, the, the banks and the specialist firms and new data vendors as well. Yeah, that's great. That all adds to the mix. That gives us choice. Um, it enables us to, to hopefully to be able to sift through all of that data and find, find the gold in there, find, find the, uh, the sources that we, we really need. Um, and then another trend you'll see is, you know, is acquisition. So we, you know, we, we have more than 30 different brokers. As we ac acquire those brokers, often they don't make that data available certainly not in a consistent format with control and governance and commercials around that. You know, we're doing that. It's not just us across the industry. You know, those larger IDBs are hoovering up other brokers and building that into their, uh, into their services. Um, and last but not least, I think so the lower barriers. So you know, cloud delivery, you can spin up a business and you can get data to customers much more quickly and cheaply today um, than you could many years ago. So before, when you needed a lot of big structure, you needed market link and context and all of those things. Now. You can spin something up on, on Azure or Google um, a lot more cheaply and a lot more quickly. OK, so that's probably enough of listening to me before lunch. Um, just to talk about our team, so there's seven of us here um, at DKF. We're proud to be Platinum sponsors. Um, coffee's on us today, so if you need another coffee after listening to me, then feel free to, uh, to jump in um, or speak to me or, or anyone from our team. And thank you for listening, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm always worried about asking that right before lunch break. So. We'll see. No, I shouldn't say good, should I? But thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Thank Enjoy you your very lunch. Much. And uh, yeah, come see us at the coffee booth. Look forward to chatting to you later.